in, in my relationship with my wife, I tell my wife that I love her. And that's an important part of our relationship, obviously. But I also uh, hold her hand. I also give her a hug. I also kiss her. And uh, those two are really important ways in which my love for her is communicated. If I only told her that I loved her and never touched her, then that would be a strange relationship. And I think what's going on in uh, communion is bread and wine are, in a sense, the touch of Christ. They're another way in which he communicates his love and his presence and his grace to us. Welcome to the Crossway Podcast, a show where we sit down with authors each week for thoughtful interviews about the Bible, theology, church history, and the Christian life. I'm Matt Tully, and today I'm talking with Tim Chester. Tim is a faculty member of Crosslands, a ministry training organization based in the UK, and he's a pastor with Grace Church in North Yorkshire. He's also an author or co-author of over 40 books, including Truth We Can Touch, How Baptism and Communion Shape Our Lives with Crossway. Today, Tim and I discuss the Lord's Supper. He explains why he thinks many evangelical churches undervalue communion, the significance of the fact that Jesus gave us physical elements, actual bread and actual wine, and what it means when we say that Christ is present in our celebration of the Lord's Supper. Let's get started. Tim, welcome to the Crossway Podcast. Uh, Good. Uh, Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So I think it's safe to say that... uh, for, for many of us, our experience as Protestant evangelicals is that uh, the Lord's Supper can be somewhat of an enigma for us. Uh, we might be in churches where it's practiced once a month, maybe a couple times a month, maybe less, and um, and sometimes it's hard to know what to do with it. We kind of, we're not really sure what's going on or why it's significant, and it's, uh, as you talk about in your book, if it were to sort of be uh, left out of the church's regular rhythm for six months or a year, we might not even notice. Uh, why do you think it is that Protestant evangelicals often uh, maybe underemphasize the Lord's Supper? I think, I think that's right. I think I, I do think we undervalue it. We're not quite sure we know what to do with it. In fact, I was talking to a woman in my congregation who who was expressing exactly that sentiment and and found it almost embarrassing because she wasn't quite sure what she was supposed to do as she took uh, bread and wine. Uh, I think there are a couple of reasons. One is, uh, and they both have a sort of bit of history, really. One is that we still uh, live in the shadow of the big debates that took place around the Reformation in the 16th century that then kind of got revived in the 19th century, particularly here in the UK, but I think it was more widely with the rise of Anglo-Catholicism, a kind of a Protestant version of Catholicism, where there was this kind of uh, debate over what the sacraments really represented, what they stood for. And ever since, what we've tended to do as Protestants is, is to define our position over against the Catholic position, over against transubstantiation, over against a kind of um, reenactment of Christ's sacrifice. And so we're very clear on what we don't think about the sacraments. But I find again and again that when I'm hearing people talk about them, they're not sure what they do mean. So we've, we've kind of got the negative worked out. But because we've been so focused on that, we get very nervous about trying to state positively what's going on both in baptism and communion. I think the other factor that's going on is that we are children of the Enlightenment. And uh, so this sort of big intellectual movement that took place uh, in uh, across the world in the kind of 18th and 19th centuries, that, that really is still sh- with us, still shapes our modern world. And there, which begins with famously, sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, iconically with um, René Descartes saying, I think, therefore I am. And uh, whatever else is going on at that moment, one of the key things is there that the action is taking place in the mind. And ever since, we think that what has meaning is what takes place in the mind, what I think and uh, the way I kind of assess what's going on around me. And then we then we get these physical objects, bread and wine and water, and we're not quite sure what to do with them. And that's why I say in the book, I think we would be a bit more comfortable, many of us as evangelicals if Jesus had said, say this in remembrance of me, or or even better, think this in remembrance of me. Uh, Here's something for you to think about, you know, but he doesn't. He gives us physical objects, bread and wine. And I think that's very significant. Yeah, explain that, unpack that. Why are those physical objects and the the physical acts of eating and drinking those things, 
uh, so valuable to us? I think there are, I mean, in, in many ways, the book was my attempt, began with my attempt to try and answer that question. And, um, and I think there are many ways of uh, answering it, but here's, here's a simple one, and I think a very powerful one is, in, in my relationship with my wife, I'm a married man, I, um, uh, I, I, I tell my wife that I love her. And that's an important part of, of our relationship, obviously. And, uh, but I also uh, hold her hand. I also give her a hug. I also kiss her. And uh, those two are really important ways in which my love for her is communicated. If I only told her that I loved her uh, and never touched her, then that would be a strange relationship, as indeed it would be if it was the other way around, if I, if I touched her but never sort of communicated with words my love for her. And I think what's going on in uh, communion is Christ is communicating his love for us. He does that every time the gospel is preached as the promises of the gospel are heard again. But because we are weak, fragile people, uh, we're not just sort of brains in a box kind of thing. We're, we're, we're embodied people. He also communicates his love for us with the, in these sort of physical ways. And so that's why bread and wine are, in a sense, the touch of Christ. They're the way in which he communicates. Uh, one of the ways in which, uh, in addition to the sort of preached word, uh, there are another way in which he communicates his love and his presence and his grace to us. Mm. So one of the, the most interesting passages that I think we encounter when we are uh, looking for communion in the Bible uh, is 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul warns us against uh, participating in communion, taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And I just want to read what he writes there and then get your thoughts on it. Uh, he writes, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. So I guess my first question is, what does it mean in this passage to eat and drink in an unworthy manner? Yeah, I think it's important to uh, look at the wider context. And the wider context is that the Corinthians, the Corinthian church, as they gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper, they're doing so in a way that, um, that rather than expressing the unity that we have in Christ, which is something that is to be celebrated, not just celebrated, I think, actually, but it's kind of reinforced by this shared meal that we have together. In the previous chapter, Paul has said, uh, we, though we are many, are one body because, because we all partake of the one loaf. Uh, so the very act of sharing together in communion reinforces the fact that we are one body. However, in Corinth, the, the opposite is happening. So a little bit earlier, he says, no doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. I think there he's being ironic. I think the Corinthians are saying, or the wealthy Corinthians, the sort of um, elite Corinthians in, 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 in worldly terms, in the kind of social hierarchies of this world, are saying, we can't just eat with riffraff in this sort of, you know, in, in, with the lower classes, as it were. There have to be differences. We have to, in the way, it's because this is how society works. Uh, uh, meals are a, a very powerful way of expressing inclusion, but 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 equally they're a very powerful way of expressing exclusion, of kind of um, maintaining and reinforcing social hierarchies. And so these uh, elite Corinthians, the sort of upper class wealthy Corinthians, are saying, well, there have to be differences among us. Uh, we can't just eat with the the hoi polloi, as it were. And uh, Paul, I think, is being ironic. He's kind of turning that on, on its head and saying, you're right, differences are revealed when you take the Lord's Supper, but not the ones you think. Actually, the real difference is between those who understand the gospel and those who don't understand the gospel. And so I think then when he says, talks about eating in an unworthy manner, 
what he has in mind is, is, is sharing the Lord's Supper in a way that does not show regard to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I think actually in verse 29, when he says, those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, he's talking there not about the physical body, but actually the church body. Uh, if you're eating it in a way that ignores the wider church body, then you're not expressing what the Lord's Supper is supposed to express, which is the reconciliation that we have with God through the death of Christ, but also with one another. So you're kind of you're, you're kind of proclaiming one thing in the uh, in the act that you're in the uh, in, in doing the Lord's Supper in the Lord's Supper, but but actually the way you're doing it is saying something else, and those are at variance with that one another. So I think that's what he means by that. It's actually talking about this kind of, and, and I guess the big point there is that the Lord's Supper reinforces and expresses not just unity with, with God in Christ, but also with one another. It's a communal corporate meal uh, that's actually integral to, integral to our life as a Christian community. When I think that passage in particular uh, and that broader context like you described can sometimes even feel a little bit um, maybe foreign to us in our own experience of communion because we we don't share a meal typically. Maybe sometimes we do. Some churches might share a, a common meal and do communion at the meal a couple times a year, but that's definitely not the norm in my experience for, for communion. Do you think we lose anything by not having that full meal? And is that is that the biblical model that we should be striving towards, or is it okay to just have these small little thimblefuls of wine and small little crackers? Uh, it's a good question. I think that um, in one sense, in the book, I've tried to steer away from a this is how you should celebrate communion, because, or, the, or indeed how you should do baptism, because I, I do want the focus to be on, on really understanding what these mean what they mean and how they shape our lives as Christians rather than sort of a kind of rule book of this is what you should do and this is what you shouldn't do. Because I think that's what's, that's the really important thing. Uh, however, uh, we normally celebrate it in the context of a meal. So we do, we love meals in our, in our particular church. And I think it's a great context to do it because communion is not just about a piece of bread and a piece of what, and a, and a sort of cup of wine. It, it's, it's, it's about those things eaten and drunk in the context of a community, in the context of faith. I think that's the point Paul's making in the previous chapters, in chapter 10, where he says, you know, in one sense, what you eat or drink is neither here nor there. There's nothing magic in the bread or the wine. But actually, in the context of a community, it becomes uh, this expression of communion with Christ. He is the host. That's where he talks about it as the Lord's table, uh, because the Lord, the Lord Jesus is hosting us in this moment. And he's contrasting that with participating uh, in pagan ceremonies where, uh, again, the meat in one sense is neither here nor there. Paul's quite happy to eat it the next day. But if you're actually participating in the ceremony in that kind of broader context, then actually, Paul says, that's a participation with demons. So the, the the positive point for us is that in this wider context, which I think is helpfully includes a meal, though I don't think it has to, uh, we're actually expressing our unity with Christ. Uh, we're we're eating in His presence, enjoying His presence through the Spirit, uh, but also our unity and our love for one another. And I think in that context, it becomes a very powerful experience that reinforces our union with Christ and our unity with one another. So even within Protestant circles, um, there can be disagreement and sometimes even debate about how exactly Christ is present. And often the, the dis discussion centers on the idea of Christ's presence at the Lord's table. Uh, how would you see that? How would you see his presence manifested in the elements? Yes, I think Christ is present, and I think he's present by his spirit. That's the kind, that's the kind of classic Reformed position. Um, I, I think the center for my argument from a biblical perspective is I just alluded to it is is uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 9 and 10, where if you sort of trace the argument that Paul's making there, this is what you find. It, the presenting issue is meat offered to idols and what should be done about that. And clearly some in the Corinthian church think it's OK because it's just meat and others think it's not OK because it's been offered to idols. And you can kind of you, know, you can see how both 
groups might come to that position. It seems clear that Paul thinks eating the meat is okay because it's just meat, nothing magic happens to it. Although his big concern, and that comes out particularly in chapter nine, is that these two uh, different groups um, treat one another with love and respect. But then in chapter 10, it takes a sort of interesting turn because in chapter 10 is where he says, uh, but I don't want you to take part in pagan ceremonies. If you do that, then you're participating with demons. And in one sense, you want to go, well, hang on a minute, Paul. A moment ago, you said eating meat offered to idols was nothing. So why suddenly the big fuss? And the point is, because it's not just about this thing that you put in your mouth. It's about the context in which it takes place. And uh, so eating meat that's been offered to idols is fine. Uh, if you're doing it the next day, as it were, around your meal table. But if actually you're doing it in the context of a pagan ceremony, that's a whole nother issue. In that situation, you're participating with demons. And to reinforce that point, Paul then parallels that to the Lord's Supper. And he says, to the, and when you take the Lord's Supper, you are participating with, in Christ. Uh, and so, in other words, we are experiencing Christ's presence, not not kind of in the bread and the wine, as in, in the kind of Roman Catholic position, but but in this in this context of a wider um, meal offered in faith, with uh, words of explanation, with prayers offered, Christ is present by his spirit. He's not physically present because he's he still has a body. He's ascended bodily into heaven. Uh, but he's present spiritually, literally by the spirit. And that's why Paul can then describe that, describe it as taking place at the Lord's table. It, it, Christ, as it were, is hosting us here. And so, and I think it's really important that we say that. We, I think we're so nervous about this sort of, um, the dangers of a, sort of heading off into a kind of Catholic position, that I think there's a danger that we miss this wonderful truth that, uh, in a way that is designed so that we expect, obviously Christ is with us, you know, I will be with you to the very ends of the earth, but but in a way that is designed to be sort of real and tangible and special for us, Christ is present in communion. And I remember Sinclair Ferguson once saying uh, that um, as as the bread and the wine are passed around, we, 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 we ought to think of the person who passes us or holds out the bread to us as doing so on behalf of Christ. So it's actually Christ himself who is offering the bread as this kind of token of his presence and his love for us. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful image. And uh, it does kind of help to answer the question that I think many of us have struggled with. And I wonder if you could offer some practical guidance or suggestions. But to the, to the Christian sitting in the pew uh, and communion has just begun and the elements are being passed out and... Um, they're sitting there wondering, what, what am I supposed to be thinking about? What am I supposed to be doing right now? Um, there's often a, a time of prayer, and I think it can be a little bit, uh, people might not always know, should I be thinking about Jesus's broken body and shed blood? Should I be feeling sorry for my sin? Should I be feeling grateful for his sacrifice? Uh, what, what guidance, practical guidance, would you offer to the person wondering those things? But in terms of just sort of the practicalities of it, the, the, in one sense, the main thing we get is Christ himself. Um, and so I, I think there's sort of two answers to your question. One is to, one, one could be to start with thinking, what is my need at the moment? Uh, and how is it that Christ meets that need? And how is it that bread and wine kind of embody and communicate that to me, the bread and the wine as they come round? Um, and that means that sometimes, you know, there might be a sorrowing of, for sin, uh, but then other times it might be quite joyous. Uh, this, is, uh, this, this meal that we share is also an anticipation of the great messianic banquet, the sort of eternal banquet where we will eat a meal in God's presence in, in, uh, in the new creation. And so, it, you know, I think it can, you, you, there are so many, as it were, notes or moods that one can uh, have in a communion service because it's represented, so it's such a rich uh, idea. So that would be one thing. What's my need? How does Christ meet that need? And uh, how, is, how do I receive that? How do the bread and wine embody that for me? The other, the other thing would just be to led by to be led by whoever is uh, leading the communion service. So I guess in most churches, 
uh, it's not just a kind of um, sort of cold liturgy, as it were, that's rattled through, but someone is guiding our thoughts. And uh, why not be led by that? And again, you know, if, if your person who is uh, uh, involved in leading communion, then I really want to encourage you to just explore, to think through the richness of this theme and to hit different notes on different occasions. Uh, and sometimes it will be about embodying promise. Sometimes it will be about a sorrowing for sin. Sometimes it will be about a marveling at the price that uh, Christ paid for our salvation. Sometimes it will be looking forward to that new creation uh, and, and many, many more. Uh, but but it, as someone who's participating, let that be what sort of guides your thoughts. And again, be thinking about how is it that the bread and wine embody this for me? So you've talked a lot about the the context for communion and why that's so important for for understanding what's actually happening, that this is done uh, with the body of other believers uh, in the context of a church, with other Christians. And I think one question that sometimes people have is, whether or not it's appropriate to celebrate communion, to take the elements uh, outside of the context of a church's worship service or worship gathering, or maybe even outside of any kind of formal church context, maybe just with a small group of friends, Christian friends in your home, or uh, people will go to the Holy Land sometimes, I know, and and celebrate communion in in certain special places there. I I wonder what your thoughts are on that, and, and even... Is it appropriate to celebrate communion without a pastor or an elder present um, as well? How would you respond to those types of questions? I think probably top of my list is would be to be guided by the uh, policy and practice of your local church. Uh, so churches will take a different view on this. And I think it is, you know, part of belonging to a church is being is submitting to its the way it conducts itself, as it were, and uh, respecting that and not being autonomous. So my that, that would be my first thing. Personally, I think it is uh, perfectly legitimate for communion to be conducted without a pastor. Uh, but uh, a lot of the kind of rubrics of different liturgies and different uh, denominational constitutions do emphasise the importance of doing it in an orderly way in a reverent way. And that's why I think often uh, in churches or denominations have said it must be conducted by a pastor. Uh, so the, uh, often that's not so much because they, they don't think that other people can do it, but they just want to create a context in which they ensure that it is done in an appropriate uh, way. And, um, and so I, which I fully respect. And uh, so that w- I think that would be my answer. I, you know, another question is, should you do it at a conference when you have a number of Christians from different churches gathered together? And again, personally, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, I think it's also appropriate to do it in smaller groups if that is done under the authority and direction of the church leaders. Again, so it's not being done in a kind of autonomous way, uh, but being as an expression of the life of the church. And I think that's the key thing. It is a local church ordinance. It is something that belongs to the local church. If the local church is happy then for, for example, if you have a small group ministry, it might be that a local church is happy for it to be, for communion to be celebrated in the smaller groups as an expression of this unity that uh, that Christians have together. I don't think you kind of have to ensure that everyone is there all the time, as it were. But again, it's being done as as an expression of that local church rather than as something that's in defiance of it or separate from it or outside of it, because I think that's, that's not right. It is, it is something that belongs to the church. And actually it's very, it's a, it's an integral way of expressing belonging to a church. And, you know, sadly in some situations of expressing exclusion from a church when excommunication essentially means excommuning, communioning people. Uh, you are excluding them from communion. That's in, in um, 2 Corinthians 5. That is how, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 5. That is how excommunication is expressed in, in not eating with somebody. And that's because, to, on the positive side, communion is this expression of our belonging to one another. Um, and so in that sense, it is very clearly a church ordinance. So you've you've used the word sacramental a couple of times and and. Uh, I wonder if you've, you've hit on this a little bit so far, but I wonder what would you say to the person listening right now who, in listening to the whole conversation, does just feel a little uncomfortable. They feel a little bit unsure of words like sacramental, uh, worried about uh, where it all might lead. But what would you say to that person specifically? 
I mean, we could talk about where the word sacrament comes from. It's it's sort of has a slightly complicated history. I, personally, I'm not too worried about it. Though I know I have good friends who who do who do get it does make them twitchy, so that's fine. I I don't want to uh, I don't want to uh, uh, frustrate them any more than is necessary. <laughs> I, I think the well, I tell you one thing that I found: the more I resist, the more I looked into. I've been I've been sort of working on this issue for probably about ten years, really. So so this 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 book has been a slow burn as I've really sort of mulled this over and um and what i found is the more i looked into it i, I you know i you know i i was brought up in the kind of uh, context where anything sacramental was viewed as slightly suspicious as if this might sort of send you off to rome kind of thing uh but as i've looked into it as i've looked into what the reformers said what the puritans said sort of our great forebears in the faith uh that actually they were they 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 were, they had a great love and commitment to the Lord's Supper, to to baptism. They saw these things as really important. They were un they didn't they were unapologetic. They were not uh, they didn't they didn't seem to suffer with the same kind of uh, neurosis and angst that we do. They 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 saw them as really important, and and they were they were un, unafraid to sort of speak of Christ present. In the communion table, that that actually, that, that that what I found was as I sort of delved into this, that rather than taking me away from my reformed evangelical roots, it was pushing me back into it. Um, so I don't know if that reassures people, but I guess even more important though is these are gifts Christ has given to His church. So unless you think Christ got it wrong and or His Christ's emphasis is wrong, then then we can as it were, press into baptism and communion without without fear, because these are Christ's gifts to his people. Hmm. So we've talked a lot about the fact that many evangelicals, in your opinion, underemphasize the Lord's Supper. Maybe just as a last question, is it possible to overemphasize it? And if so, what might that look like? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know the answer. To... I mean, is it possible to overemphasize the Word of God? I don't think so. There might be ways of doing it in way that, that are unhealthy, and I think that might be my answer. You know, there are ways of emphasizing the sacraments that I think are unhelpful, um, and certainly I don't want the sacraments to the exclusion of the word. Uh, that it's word and sacrament together are the two great marks of the church, and actually the together is really where the, I think where there's real power. Where, where actually the word is being embodied in the sacrament, the sacrament is explained by the word, and and, and not just in some kind of theoretical sense, but week by week, you know, if, as, as you preach, and, and whether you take communion immediately afterwards or in a separate meeting or however you organise it, if you're making the link between that, then in the kind of um, shared life of God's people there, as they are being fed by this word, it's then being reinforced in the bread and the wine and uh, or perhaps in that word you're doing as Paul so often does in his writings and Peter pointing people back to their baptism and to the identity that they have as baptized people uh, then I think there's a real power in word and sacrament going together in that way uh, so I think not so much I'm not worried about people overemphasizing the sacraments I, I, I but you know I share all the um, traditional concerns about emphasizing them in a wrong way uh, and uh, misunderstanding what they're about, but 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 don't let that fear sort of um, make it a no-go area. Let's let, instead let's think a little bit about what it actually what actually uh, bread, wine, and water symbolise and signify for us, so that actually we understand the the riches that are offered to us by Christ as His gifts, uh, uh, not just sort of offered as it were two thousand years ago when He commissioned the, the uh, first apostles, but but week by week. He is offering himself a kind of uh, embodied, reinforced experience of his promises and his grace and his love and his presence to us week by week. Um, and that, I think, something is, is something to treasure and to relish. Well, Tim, thank you so much for taking some time to, yeah, to help us all understand a little bit better what God intends for us in the Lord's Supper and just why it's so important for each of us as Christians. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, thank you. Pleasure. Good fun. That was Tim Chester on the Lord's Supper. For more, be sure to check out his book with Crossway, Truth We Can Touch, How Baptism and Communion Shape Our Lives, available online or at your local Christian bookstore.
For more interviews like this, subscribe to the Crossway Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review, which helps us spread the word about the show. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.